Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Hello, everyone. It's Jesse Green. Welcome back to SavvyDentist.com and to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. It is fantastic to have your company for another episode of our show. Now, today we're talking about something that I think is an incredibly important topic because this topic, like no other, has the potential to multiply the results in your practice many, many times over. It is a force multiplier. Typically, when it comes to thinking about business growth, we look at all the operational stuff and that's important and we've got to get that right. But team culture is this lever that I'm referring to that if we can pull that lever, we can absolutely maximize the results of our business. So if we're going to achieve any success in business, we're going to typically need a team. And if we need a team, well, then culture is going to be an important part of that. And my guest today is Steve Simpson. Steve's been working in that culture space for a long time. He's worked with large multinationals such as McLaren and Next and other big businesses like that. And he's also worked with small and medium enterprises as well. And in our conversation today, we talk a lot about what culture is, what it's not, but we talk specifically about unspoken ground rules, these UGRs. And these UGRs are fundamentally important to really get our head around because they set the tone for the practice. And culture really is coming back to someone's perception of how things are done around here. And this word perception is critically important. We pull that apart in our conversation. So in our conversation with Steve, we really get very practical. We're talking about culture from a very hands-on, down-to-earth, get-it-done kind of viewpoint. We're not talking about academic theory. We're not talking about you know university articles or scholarly articles. We're talking about things that make a difference at the coalface. And so as you go through and listen to this episode, please have a pen and paper handy because there are plenty of pearls of wisdom, lots of gold nuggets that you're going to want to take down and implement into your practice straight away. Now, Steve's also very generously given out a resource and you can grab a hold of that resource by emailing him directly. And his email address is steve at ugrs.net. But if you want to check out his website where there's resources and videos and other things, head across to steve-simpson.com and you'll find plenty of stuff there to sink your teeth into. Now, before we get into our conversation with Steve, I also want to tell you some exciting news because coming up in September, there is a Dental Growth Summit that's being held online. It's a free event. So if you're a practice owner and you're thinking about you know, what you want to do with your practice, whether it's driving it to new heights, you know, maximizing income, uh, increasing your free time, increasing you know, the cohesiveness of your team, increasing your overall results, all of those things, whether you want to grow, scale your practice or anything in between, this Success Summit is going to have something really, really practical and useful for you. There's a whole panel of speakers. I'm delighted to be included in that panel. I've got a couple of sessions coming up and I'm joined by some great people where we're going to talk about other revenue streams. We're going to be talking about team, of course. We're going to be talking about you know, marketing and everything in between, capacity, all those sorts of things are going to come up. So if you want to come along to this Growth Summit, all you need to do is head across to practicesuccess.org forward slash dental growth 2022. And I'll just read that again, practicesuccess.org forward slash dental growth 2022. Come along and register. It's totally free and we're going to have a great conversation there. And again, as always, bring pen and paper to that too because there'll be plenty of things to take away from there that's going to really drive your business into the future and help you achieve your very best results. So please do register for that. Now, but let's get into our conversation with Steve. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed recording. Here's Steve Simpson. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us on the Savvy Netters podcast. How are you today, my friend? Very well, Jess, and I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, me too, me too, um, because we're talking about a topic that I think is going to be critically important to everyone listening to this podcast, and that is all around culture and, and how to create a great and winning culture. But I want to ask you a little bit before we get started, because you've been working in this space for a long time. You've worked with large multinationals. You've worked with medium and small businesses as well. Um, but some of the large businesses are like McLaren and Next and others. I'm curious to ask you, you know, what was your journey to this point? What was the, the realisation for you that culture was something really important? And, and how did you find your way into that space? Jesse, I, um, in my younger years, was 
intrigued. I, I came across the notion of TQM. That's how long ago it was. Like this is 1980s. Oh, God, I remember and that. And one of the elements, one of the elements of TQM, which really fascinated fascinated me, was the notion of genuinely focusing on customer service. You know, not not talk, actually doing it and mm. differentiating yourself that way. So um, that's an area that I explored. And um, when I quit my uh, full-time job and became a consultant, I used to specialise in customer service. And I realised after not that long that I was having a big impact in some places and not others in terms of my message. And that confused me because the message wasn't different in these different companies that I was working with, but the take-up was dramatically different. Some would run with it and others I knew didn't do anything with it. So then I pondered, well, what's causing this? And I realised that it was the culture of these places that was the determining factor. And that then led me down the culture path to explore, well, what does culture actually mean? How can we get a, get a fix on cultures? What can we do to actually improve it? Because ultimately, talk great customer service all, all you like, it'll go nowhere unless the culture is right. And that, by the way, applies to many other things. It applies to safety, where that's an issue with an organisation, you know, in a particular industry. It applies to the receptiveness to change. So there's so many aspects that culture impacts that um, that became my passion and um, that's where I am today. Well, look, you've already given me 100 uh, threads to start our conversation <laughs> with, so thank you for that. There's, there's a heap there. And you, you kind of asked my first question for me, actually, which was, you know, kind of what is culture? Because sometimes culture is one of those things that's not always easy to, easy to pin down. And you can feel it, you know, you know, what's going on, but it's hard to describe sometimes. So I wanted to ask you really what culture is and, and, and of course, why then does it matter? Jesse, when I was 26 years old, I uh, studied for a master's degree in Canada and I read about organisational cu- culture way back then, so that's a long time ago. Mm. I, when I decided I was going to focus on culture, went back to the books that I'd read and I quickly came to the view there is no way I'm going to present back to people I'm working with with any of the stuff that I've read because it was so academic, yeah. so esoteric, so impractical, so theoretical. That caused me to come up with my own concept. Mm -hmm. And my concept is called UGRs, which stands for Unwritten Ground Rules, Mm -hmm. uh, which I define as people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. That definition, by the way, Jesse, is vitally important. People's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. So some examples of UGRs that I've come across include things like at our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because we know nothing will get done. Uh, The only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong. And to come back to the customer service example, the organisation talks about the importance of customer service, but we know they don't really mean it, so we don't really have to worry about Mm. about it. So these UGRs, these unwritten ground rules, drive people's behaviour, yet they are seldom, if ever, talked about openly. It's the UGRs that are your culture. Culture is merely people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. Jesse, it's not complicated. You know, despite the books that I read, in spite of the books that I read, it's not complicated. It's merely people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. It's the UGRs. I think one of the things that you touched on was the practical elements of that because I remember reading about culture years ago. Also, I'm old enough to remember TQM, by the way, um, (laughs) um, which dates me pretty badly. One of the things I was just thinking about is the practicality of culture because like you, I've read management book after management book and, and you know, found myself getting tied in knots of theory and, and models and all these sorts of things. And so what I really like is the practicality of what you've said is the perception, you know, people's perception of how things are done around here. What, you know, why culture matters? What, why is it such a big deal? And you know, why should we care? Because does it, does it add a tangible benefit if we do put time and effort into this? Because we've already said it's a bit esoteric, it's hard to understand. So what's the value in going through the thought exercise or the, the discipline, you know, something that's simple but not easy, to get this culture thing right? Yeah, it's a really good question, Jesse. And um, we did some research a while back and I'll be honest with you, we stumbled on this question. Mm. But now whenever I get in front of leaders... I'm keen to ask this question. In fact, leaders and staff, um, I'm keen to ask this question. The question we asked in our research was, 
If the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Now, in our research, we gave people a sliding scale. Started at zero. Zero is a legitimate answer. Mm-hmm. You think you might think the culture now, realistically, is as good as it's going to get. So zero is a legitimate answer. And then we gave people a sliding scale, 10%, 20 and then up to 100 and 100% plus. Whenever I get the chance now, I'll ask this face-to-face or since COVID, uh, Zoom to Zoom or team to team. I remain gobsmacked at the responses that I get from leaders. A few weeks back, Jesse, I was in Sydney and I was working with the leaders in one company, which is, by the way, doing very, very well. It's, um, it's a very successful company. And I asked the leaders that question. And the average that the leadership team gave, because I whiteboarded each individual's response to this. Give me a percentage. Yep. The average was 80%. That's eight zero. Wowzers. Now, I said to them, let's presume you're wildly over-optimistic. Let's halve it. Would yeah. you take it? Like, through what other initiative could you possibly gain performance improvement of that magnitude? And, Jesse, I don't want to go on too long, but one of the things that I think characterises teams and organisations that are genuinely able to sustain a focus on culture and differentiate themselves with culture is a leadership team that is in a constant state of unease with where they're at and a desire to get better. And I work with Kmart over eight years, and, Mm -hmm. you know, the Kmart story is remarkable. They had literally lost money for 10 years in a row. Not many people realise this. West Farmers purchased it, put in place a new leader, Guy Russo, the best leader I've ever met. Mm -hmm. He had a passion for culture and UGRs, and they had a toxic culture at Kmart Mm -hmm. and completely turned it. Now they're making half a billion dollars in profit, not solely due to culture. Let's be honest here. There was a number of other initiatives, but that was one of the uh, key change platforms, converting, turning 180 degrees their culture. Three or four years in, when they turned their culture, I said to the guys at, in the Kmart leadership team that question, if the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance? Even at that point, they came up with, a, with an average of 40%, 4 zero. Mm. So that taught me something I think that's really important, and that is we've, as leaders, got to have a constant state of unease with where we're at. I guess it's the reverse to being complacent. You know, we've got to stop, we've got to resist being complacent and continually fight for something even better than what we currently got because there's enormous benefits that flow from this. Firstly, before we get into how to create a great culture, how does a toxic culture or a poor culture at least come to be? Is it just through benign neglect or is it what trips people up? How do you end up in that place? Well, you see, I think there's a key question that every leader needs to consider and that is, are our current UGRs, or to paraphrase that, is our current culture a function of luck or chance, mm. or is it by design? My view is that in the vast majority of cases, despite the fact that many leaders say that culture is important, blah, 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 they're leaving it to luck or chance. Why? Because in most cases, and I honestly believe it's most, Despite leaders feeling and knowing that their culture is not as good as it could be, they actually don't know what to do about it Mm. because it's hard to get your hands on. It's hard to grasp. It's hard to put the right language to this, you know. And by the way, I think that's where UGRs has a huge part to play. It gives language and structure to understanding and improving the culture. So, you know, the short version is, Jesse, I would say it's benign neglect. Mm. And it's easier to stay busy on other things. There's always issues to be resolved. I mean, that's that's the job of leaders, isn't it? It's to fix problems, yeah. you know? Yep. And that can become overwhelming and totally time-consuming. So it's easier to focus on the operational stuff that we know than to focus on what might appear to be a very soft, even, you know, touchy-feely thing like culture, which is how it's viewed by many people because they they haven't understood the business case for culture. And that's that's a key thing. And that's why I share that research question. We've got to understand that there is a genuinely solid business case for culture. Uh, Look, one of the things I'm thinking about here is you're right. Culture is sometimes hard to pin down. Um, yeah, sometimes I think of it as like trying to catch a fish barehanded, you know, know, just, (laughs) you just kind of feel like you're just about to grab it and it slips through your fingers a little bit. I've worked in organizations where there's been great culture and I've worked in organizations where there's been lousy culture and I understand the challenges and difficulties that go into consciously and deliberately trying to create a positive culture. 
What I wanted to ask you, though, is you, you said that UDRs give structure and language to culture. I wanted to ask you, what are the elements of culture? What are the building blocks? What are the fundamentals? What goes into a, a, a culture? Well, look, just to give, give you an insight into the power of UGRs, because I want to share how we can use this. I want to get really practical on this. But yep. it may be valuable for people to reflect on the context of a new employee. So a new employee, and by the way, it doesn't matter how senior they are, I think this is pretty close to a 100% rule. A new employee will normally stay quieter than they otherwise would be. Mm. I think that's pretty close to 100% of cases. Why is that the case? Well, I say to people, it's because at an unconscious level, they are tuning in to the UGRs. It's not a conscious thing, but this is it's a function of being human beings. Mm. And it's not confined to work. Like any new group we're confronted with mm. will normally stay quieter. Why? Because we're finding out what the UGRs are. Why? In order that we can conform. That's the power of UGRs. I mean, it's quite remarkable. So I often ask people, well, what is it that we're looking at, albeit un- unconsciously? What is it that we're tuning into? What are we looking at? What are we trying to determine in that quiet phase there's an almost infinite number of cues that we can tune into. So people will look at things like, you know, are meetings punctual? Um, well, what, what's the whole issue of punctuality? Do people rock in 10 minutes late for a meeting or you're, are you expected to be on time? It's interesting, um, Jesse, I was, I was talking with a change man- management group in the yep. US yep. Um, very recently. One woman in this group said, you know, even the lunch arrangements... There are UGRs associated with that. So do people have lunch at their desk uh, or at their workstation or do they have a a place where they have lunch together? Do they go out and have lunch together? And this woman said that uh, that a company she joined, they went out for lunch from time to time and she was in the queue at the restaurant with her colleagues in front of her Mm. and all of her colleagues ordered salad. So... What did she order? She ordered salad. Salad, yeah. I'm associated with that. Wow, wow, okay. Um, It's remarkable when you think about it. There are are these cues that we're tuning into that are driving our behaviour. It's like there's a parallel universe because my behaviour, your behaviour has been dictated by these UGRs and yet we never put it on the table. We never get explicit about it. You know, that's that's the enormous power of these. So I wanted to ask you something because we've spoken about that. It's almost like to me like the elephant in the room. Yeah, it's kind of there, but no one's talking about it. Yeah. How, yeah. how do you uncover what your existing UGRs are? Because it might not be exactly the culture you're trying to create, but how do you get a feel or a sense of what the current culture actually is and then kind of figure out whether that's where you want it to be or not. But what's that process look like? Okay, this is getting practical now, and this yeah. is getting back to two Australian universities funded world-first research into UGRs uh, more than 20 years ago, and this was a massive eye-opener into how to reveal the prevailing UGRs. Mm. But, Jesse, I'm going to maybe disappoint you and say <laughs> there is a step before that. Okay, okay. all right, all right. It's, an important, it's a vitally important first step because I will say to any leadership team, for us to truly make inroads on our culture, our first step involves gaining clarity and commitment to our aspirational culture. Mm. That is, And there's a golden question that sits under, underneath this, and that is... What does our culture need to look and feel like for us to truly be successful while also making it a great place to work? Mm. The answers to that question we can call values or we might simply reaffirm the current values if we already have them. But we need both clarity and commitment, and I mean genuine commitment, Mm. to this aspirational culture. Not for the sake of... Look, my fear is that many organisations have values, but they've been framed with good intent Mm. but done badly because the question has been, so what do we want our values to to be? Now, that's context-free and it's strategically free. We need to get strategic with our culture and say, what's the kind of culture we need to have in place for us to truly be successful while also making this a great place to work. So, you know, that's that's a vitally important first step. Just on that for a moment, because I, I love the fact that we're talking about values. I, I, I too think they're fairly foundational when it comes to culture. 
One of the things that I find when people talk about values, uh, Steve, is that there's two or three things I've observed is they end up being really great motherhood statements which sound all-encompassing and you know, grandiose at the time, but then they kind of get framed on the wall and gather dust never to be seen again. Yeah. You know, I think the UGRs, I imagine, is the habits and behaviours that are going to probably bring these uh, values to life. This is what I suspect. I'm not sure. I don't want yeah. to preempt. Yeah. But why in the past have values kind of stopped just articulating values without going to that next step, which is the UGRs or the habits or the behaviours? What, what was that breaking point? What, what was that interruption there? Okay. And, and remember, Jesse, that when the values are framed, they are done with really good intent, mm. you know? Yeah. So we ought not lose sight of that. These are framed with really good intent. Look, sometimes they're done because the next company has them or the next practice has them and we we need to as well. But that's in a minority of cases, you know, so they're done with good intent. This is really, really important, okay? Mm. Now, this happened long ago, for, long ago enough for me that I can name the organisation in this, in this case, okay? okay. Yep. So I'm working with the guys in Next in the UK. Now, yep. many of the listeners to this will know that Next used to, used to be a major bricks and mortar retailer mm-hmm. and they've gone heavily online. Mm-hmm. And I worked with their IT division in the UK. This was pre-COVID. Yes. And there was over 600 people in that division. Like, oh, this is big, right? Wow, yeah. 600 people in their IT division. We did UGRs with them. I did a debriefing session with the leaders the next day and... I posed this question to the leaders, and I think this answers your point here, Jesse. I said to the leaders, if I went to your people, leaders, Mm. and you leaders are not in the room, Mm. how do you think they would answer this question? What are your leaders' top three priorities? Mm. There was a stunned silence in the room for quite some time across the next leaders, and the first guy to speak up, much to his credit, says... Steve, we don't even know what our top three priorities are, so how would they? Yeah, wow. So what's the point here? Do we want culture or people or values or a synonym of those words Mm. to be a top three priority? Because you know what? If it's not, then put the values on the wall, but they will gather dust. Mm. They will not. There will be no traction on that. And I think that's the answer. That Mm. is, is culture or values or people or a synonym of those words a genuine top three priority of the leaders. I used to think top five, but no, it's got to be top three or it's not a priority. If it is, then it will gain, the values will gain traction. There's another company that I've worked with, they call their values the North Star. Mm. Now, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I I really like the the imagery behind that because our our values and our culture ought to be our North Star and we've got to be serious about this or not. We've got to make that decision. You mentioned that before we understand the prevailing prevailing UGRs, we've got to get clear about what our values are and to be, you know, conscious of that and elevate that and, and to make them real. So just to come back to understanding how to articulate the prevailing UGRs, What's that look like? Okay, so now we get the real practical stuff. Mm. This is where we lean on the outcomes from research undertaken by two Australian universities more than 20 years ago where Mm. we unearthed the way to find out what the current UGRs are, Mm -hmm. okay? This is thanks to Professor Jeff Souter, who at the time was the Dean of the Graduate School of Management at the University of Western Australia. Mm -hmm. And he came up with this method, which I've been using ever since, and it's unbelievably simple but enormously powerful. Yep. In our research, we've got people to reflect on the way we do things around here. We have five companies involved in the research and we've got people to reflect on the way we do things around here and complete the sentence to what we now call lead-in sentences. In our research, for example, Jesse, we've got people to complete this sentence. Around here, customers are, complete the sentence, anonymous, reflection of the, your perception of the way we do things around here. Mm-hmm. We were amazed at what came back. We literally had responses like, a customers are a pain in the ass." I kid you not. Oh, wow. One person wrote, and this is, this is word for word correct, uh, true, around here customers are an interruption to my working day. I kid you not. We literally had those words. Oh, 
Gosh. It was a revelation because each of these organisations had wonderful documentation proclaiming their commitment to customer service, right? Mm, mm. What a load of rubbish if they're the prevailing UGRs. Wow. So we realised at that time that we had stumbled across this incredibly simple but powerful method of unearthing the UGRs. And what we've got a bit smarter since that time... And we don't just do random lead-in sentences now. What we do is we craft them to link back to the values, our aspirational culture. Mm. So if we have a value of respect, for example, we'll get people to complete the sentence, around here, people are treated. Complete Mm. the sentence. Mm, Okay. If we have a value of constant improvement, we'll get people to complete the sentence, around here, when someone comes up with a new idea. We have a value of accountability around here when someone says they'll do something. Now, all of those lead-in sentences are up for grabs. We can edit, modify, whatever. We craft them so that the organisation we're working with is comfortable with the with the uh, lead in sentence that we craft. And when we do this online, we do something really nifty because in addition to having a free-range text box... Next to the text box, we get each person to self-categorise their response as having a positive, neutral or negative impact on the organisation overall. So if somebody writes, around here, people are treated like school children, they'll tick the negative box. Mm. Around here, people are treated with respect and dignity, they'll tick the positive box. So now we've got two forms of data. We've got a quantitative, a percentage breakdown of positives, neutrals and negatives yes. for each of those lead-in sentences, self-categorised, plus And this is where the richness is. We've got the qualitative, which is the words that people write bunched into groups of positive, neutrals and negatives. It makes for a gobsmackingly interesting report, Jesse. Wow. I I reckon if you're the leader of that and, you know, that report comes back to you, you know, obviously, hopefully you're you're hoping that you've got a great um, culture and everything is good, but it must be sobering for some leaders when they get that report back and they see what's really going on and they realise that, hey, this is not what we're trying to create. What sort of reactions have you seen from the leaders when they've received that feedback? Oh, look, Jesse, and that's perceptive of you. There is no doubt that there is an element in this which is confronting mm. because no one's coming, no leaders are coming to work, no. you know, and saying, how can I make more negative UGRs today? <laughs> exactly, you know, right. It doesn't happen. No. And so what, what we've learned over the years is that we've got to hold the hands of leaders mm to walk them through this and to reassure them that whatever results we get presents a wonderful opportunity because this isn't by design. It's just through circumstance and history and personalities Mm. that we have what we've got. So we'll never get any group where there is 100% positives. We're not human beings if that's the case. So there will always be a mix and it is confronting. But I would say... And this is a bit harsh, but I would say, so what's the alternative? Yeah, well, that's right. It's you know? kind of blissful ignorance, but which becomes unblissful at some point in the time, in the future. Well, yeah. So, yeah, you're right, it is confronting, but what I also say to leaders is that you are primarily but not, res- but not solely responsible for the culture because staff play the game of UGRs. We've got to remember that. And that, that should be comforting for leaders to know that, hang on, it's not entirely on the shoulder of leaders. Mm. And that's that's a reassurance I think they need to take on board. So one of the things that I'm curious to ask you, because it sounds like this is a top-down approach in the sense that the leaders create the culture and then you know we're hoping that the team pick it up and run with it. Is that a reasonable assertion before I continue on? Obviously everyone owns it, everyone has to own it, but I'm just curious to ask if it's set, if the direction is set by the leadership. Well, yeah, it's largely shaped by leaders, but, mm. but there are paradoxical situations where we can have a reasonably good leader with an ordinary culture. Why? Because of the staff. Mm. We can have an ordinary leader with a great culture. Why? Because of the staff. So we should not lose sight of the fact that staff are big players in this. So to the point where we get where, ta- where culture might not have been seriously tackled, it's fair to say that leaders have been primarily responsible to that point. Mm. But if we genuinely want to change the culture, my view is there is no silver bullet when it comes to culture change. Mm. But if there was, I would put my money on shared ownership. We mm. need to get shared ownership of the culture and shared excitement about the prospects for an even better culture than we've got right now. And when that happens, it becomes unstoppable and staff become the protectors and the thermostat for a great culture. It happened at Kmart where it becomes unstoppable. Yeah, obviously Kmart went through their uh, their process of 
articulating what their prevailing UGRs are. There's probably a bit of, uh, I guess, reflection upon that. And then obviously they've gone on to, to change it and to do things really well. So I'm, I'm curious to ask, one of the things that may be happening, there'll be people listening here, with, you know, dental practice owners, and they'll be sitting there thinking, well, A, I haven't consciously thought about culture, so maybe I need to start being you know, more proactive in that department. But B, if I have um, been thinking about that culture and I'm still not happy and content that we're you know, in the space or place that we need to be, you know, what strategies might they be thinking about to keep that moving in the right direction you know, that we could learn from Kmart, for example? When we have the lead in sentences linked back to the values, we're mm. opening windows into the UGRs mm. associated with each of the values mm. when we do these lead in sentences, okay? When we do that, we are keen in the first instance to share the outcomes with the leaders, but then to share the results with all staff, mm. to be totally transparent. Now, on some occasions we need... Well, we need to redact. That's the word I was searching for. We need to redact if names are named. That happens seldom, but it does happen on occasions mm. with someone when they write a response, will name somebody. Well, we'll, we'll redact that, mm. and that's the right thing to do. Of course. But we'll share the results with staff, right? We'll get sh- the staff getting involved, and this is what we did with Kmart, mm. in interpreting the results. What are the major messages and themes across the positive comments, across the neutrals, and across the negatives? But then most importantly, and this is the key, Jesse, getting staff to reflect on what is it that we can do to make improvements to any areas of concern that we see in this stock take results, right? Let's also celebrate the successes here because it's not all bad. There's plenty of good stuff here. Mm. But then let's get staff involved in saying what is it we can do? And I'm very keen to get staff to reflect on what is it that you as an individual might do differently tomorrow that's going to make a difference to this aspect of our culture such that were we to do this repeat stock take six months or 12 months down the track, we will get a a much more positive response. What is it that each each and every one of us can do? And it might seem trivial or superficial. I don't care. Think about something. Look, I've had people say, oh, we can say good morning to each other. Well, yeah, there's a good idea. Write that down, you know. The yeah. sum total of what might seem trivial or superficial can sometimes result in quite profound changes to the culture. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, we talk about this grid that I talk about called the performance culture matrix where, you know, people are either good performers or, or not or they're a culture fit or not. My question for you is once you've articulated that great culture and you've, you, you've defined it, you've gone through this exercise, what can we do and all the rest of it, do you think that people who are not a culture fit can become a great culture fit? Obviously there's got to be a willingness to do that. Or do you kind of feel like if there's a values mismatch or, or something like that, then never the twain shall meet? Well, I'm just curious to ask about those people. Yeah, it's a really good question, Jesse. Because um, they keep us awake at night, basically. <laughs> yeah, this is a bit left field. Yeah. I'm coming from an uneducated point of view when I say this. Yes. I think a massive source of workplace stress, which remains totally unexplored, relates to contexts where people feel compelled to conform to UGRs that go against their personal values. Mm. Now, I honestly think that's totally unexplored. So there is that side of things where people feel trapped living in a workplace where the UGRs go against their personal values. That's okay? right. So yeah. that, that's one circumstance. I was working with a group and there was an older guy, similar age to me, who, and I'm working on UGRs for half the day with this group, mm. and this guy could not have been displaying more negative body language than he was displaying in the room. Mm. I mean, he was almost, he was sat down so he was almost horizontal, like can you picture this? Like yeah. his elbows on the windowsill, you yeah. know, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. looking at the window. Could not, if he tried, display more negative body language. Yeah. I'm doing UGR. So, you know, I've, I've got to walk the talk here. So during the first break, I approached this guy and I, I, I say, can we have a chat, you know, just in private? He says, yeah, whatever. And I say, look, let's call him Gary. I said, Gary, I may be interpreting this, this incorrectly, but my perception, I'm picking up a UGR uh, from your body language, which says you don't want to be here, right? Mm. And have I got that right? And he said, well, yeah, you're 100% right. And then we had a bit of a conversation and there was a, a turning point in our conversation because I said to Gary um, midway through our conversation, so Gary, have you always been this way? Mm. And he stopped at that moment and said, 
Do you know what, Steve? I haven't. I said, so what's happened, mate? What, what, what's happened? And that was a circuit breaker in his mind. And I went on to say, mate, if you don't want to be part of this session, honestly, there's no drama. You know, there's, you don't feel compelled to be here. And he said, you know what? I'm going to stay. His, his, his attitude turned 180 degrees. Mm. So my point from that, Jesse, is that I think many people who are displaying negativity in the workplace have fallen into the trap of thinking this is the way it has to be and my situation is hopeless. Mm. There is nothing I can do or nothing that will happen that will change things from my perspective. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes being exposed to the concept of UGRs snaps people into realising that, hang on, maybe it's not as hopeless as I thought it was. Having said that, there will be personality values mismatches there will be mm-hmm. maybe i've deluded people into thinking that this is an easy process because that's that's not the case there is a very hard edge to this and that is what about a person who is a really really good operator really good who is destroying the culture yep right that's the person that stu- that's the person i'm talking about they're the ones that keep us awake at night that's what we call a c play they're the ones that give me headaches to the cows come home and give everyone else headaches too that's the person i want to know about well i would say give them exposure to ugrs because without being exposed to ugrs we don't know whether it's uh, whether their behavior is deliberate mm. or unconscious mm. Once they learn about UGRs, they have to make a conscious choice. And if their behaviours don't change, then this is the hardest part of the job for leaders because leaders, you've got to make a conscious choice. You've got to make a conscious choice then. Mm. Do we compromise on our culture by keeping these people on board or do we make the really, really hard decision of allowing that person to go? If you decide to retain that person, you are creating a UGR. Mm. And the UGR is culture is not the most important thing around here. Yep. This is hard edge, and it's made even further complicated, Jesse, because, look, I'm learning that there's a global phenomenon nowadays. It's global, and I don't know why, but there's staff shortages in every first world country right now. So the prospect of letting these high-performer, culture-toxic people go is even more scary because where do you get a replacement from? It's tough. That's the conundrum. That is the business owner's conundrum in 2022 as we're recording this and probably for some years to come. I really appreciate you unpacking that. Can I go back to something you spoke about a little earlier just because there's something I've got an I've got an open loop in my mind. I just want to make sure I close the loop if that's cool. <laughs> I've got, I got, t- I got, got, got a couple of hundred open loops in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so my open loop is going back to the definition, which was people's perception of how we do things around here. The word perception versus the reality, you know, one person's perception might just be their perception um, versus the reality or other people's perceptions. And then my follow-up question is, how do we change people's perceptions? Okay, so you and I, Jesse, go into a room, we watch a political speech on TV. Okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. And you walk out, say it's the best speech I've ever seen. Yep. I walk out and I say it's the worst. Yep. We've just experienced the same thing yep. and our perceptions are diametrically opposed. Why? Because of our different DNA, our past experiences and a multitude of other things, mm-hmm. our perceptions are different. You might think we do a UGR stock take where we get people to complete the sentence and you read these comments and you say, or the leader says, these perceptions are wrong. I say irrelevant. That perception is driving their behaviour. I'll yep. give you an example, Jesse. We've done many stock takes where we've had a lead in sentence around here when someone comes up with a new idea. Mm. I'm not kidding you. We have literally had responses which say, bosses pinch the good ones and claim them as their own. Mm. Right? Now, how bad is that? When someone mm. comes up with a new idea, bosses pinch the good ones and claim them as their own. Ooh. Whether that's a justified perception is irrelevant, that's going to drive their behaviour at the next meeting and subsequent meetings because when the chair of the meeting says any ideas, that person's got ideas but there's no way they're going to share them because their UGR is driving their behaviour. Mm. So there's two sources of perceptions. One is... Factually, they are correct. That is, if I was a fly in the wall watching events unfold, I would come to the same view and a 100 other people would come to the same view as the person who has that perception. 
The other possibility is that their perception is actually wrong and it might be based on their DNA or past experiences or past UGRs. Mm. Now, this is important. There is a, this notion called legacy UGRs, which might have been factually correct five years ago, mm. but all the players have changed, leaders have changed, staff have changed, but the UGRs have locked in. Mm. And Jesse, I've seen people lamenting how it used to be so good 20 years ago. Like, they did that and they don't let it go. So they need to be snapped out of that. And again, I think UGRs can force people, in a sense, to do a bit of a stock take in their own head about, hang on, do I need to rethink this? It's irrelevant. If it's a perception, it's a perception, and, and that's, that's cool. You've alluded to the fact that, you know, getting this right is a force multiplier in your business. And if you get it wrong, it's obviously, you know, going to be a bit of a handbrake on the business as well. If we've taken the time to go through this exercise, obviously we want to be very protective of our new uh, installed UGRs and they're going really well. It's about bringing new people into the business and preserving those UGRs. How do we identify the right people and how do we set them up for success? Yeah, Jesse, I fear that I'm not going to be um, provide a very adequate answer to this because this rem- remains, I think, the eternal mystery. How do you... How do you get the selection process right? I mean, that is just such a paradox, isn't it? It's tough. Let me say that I will remind people that we are staying quieter as new people in order to find out what the UGRs are, in order that we can conform. Mm. So the UGRs will modify our behaviours as new people Mm. because we feel a desire to fit in, right? Mm. So there is that aspect. So UGRs... And, and look, I'll give you an example in reverse, a, a positive a UGR. I should have said right from the outset, UGRs are not always negative. No. There are positive UGRs, there is neutral and there's negative. So if you're on a positive team right now, by definition, there are positive UGRs. It has to be the case. So a new person comes in, for example, to a practice, the prevailing UGR is patients are our number one priority, right? The new person comes in and slips up and says, oh, these patients are a pain in the ass." Mm. If the culture is really good, the other staff will pull that new person in a line. Hang on, we don't talk about patients in that way here. That's, yeah. not, that's not the way, you know. So we can pull people up as well as pull them down. Yeah. I had a year off after school and I worked carting furniture in, you know, the furniture removal company. Mm-hmm. And I literally got told, slow down, boy. Those words were used, slow down, boy. That's dragging me back, right, because I was moving too fast for the EUGRs. But it, we can pull up as well. So that's, that's an important point to remember. Yeah. A funeral company I was working with, now that was an interesting experience, doing UGRs in a funeral company. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if, so, if, so, yeah so if someone says slow down in that kind of business, well, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to slow down too much because you, know, you don't want to stop. The leader in this funeral company had a brilliant strategy. They taught people about UGRs uh, as part of their induction yeah. and they locked in an interview with the boss two weeks down the track for the boss to listen to the new employee about some of the UGRs that that new employee had detected. How good's that? That's fantastic. I really like that. That's How a great, that? that's a, I'll tell you, there's a practical implementable thing right there, ladies and gents. If you uh, uh, just write that one down, that's a writer downer, I would say, and, uh, and I'd implement that straight up. Thank you, mate. That's gold. Let's get absolutely clear about what our aspirational culture is. Let's make that clear to new employees. Let's demonstrate. How do you make sure the culture is a priority? Well, you dig the talons in and don't let this go. You're constantly talking about your values. You're constantly getting feedback. How are we going, guys, at meetings? What are we, pick one value. How are we going on this one? What are we doing well? What are the opportunities for improvement? So the new employee, a month after they've started, goes to a social function and somebody says to them, didn't you start a new job recently? And they go, you wouldn't believe this place. Mm. I've never seen a place that's so committed and serious about their culture. Like they, they, they talk freely at their meetings about what's going well, what, what opportunities are there for improvement, and it's real talk, you know. So, I mean, if people sense that, then they're going to want to be part of this positive, productive, dynamic team, you know. So we can bring people along with us. What happens when the leader slips out of alignment with the UGRs? I can think of some companies that I've worked with. I can think of, you know, organisations I've been part of where by and large the leaders were pretty good. They're doing their very best. But, you know, they have their bad days. They have their good days like the rest of us. So I'm curious to ask you about the role of the leader and kind of making sure they're setting the example but also 
being a little bit compassionate and kind of being human in that element as well. Jesse, when I work with people, I will often ask a question and the question is, do we give each other permission to call people in an appropriate way yeah. when our values are breached, yep. right? Do we give each other permission? And my advice, and I, I'm keen to share this with as many people as possible, my advice is that we ought to be guided by two principles and they are always be driven by good intent Always try and be constructive. Yeah. And I honestly believe if we're driven by those two principles, we can't go too far wrong. And if that's the case, then it's appropriate and right that leaders are called, mm. just as we would hope that staff would be open to being called, so it should apply to us as well. Yeah. These very conversations about is it okay to call behaviour when leaders breach our values or whatever, those conversations should be had as well. Let's let's put this on the table and help people understand they are human too. And then there are imperfections, guys. Yeah. You know? A hundred percent. They need help too. Yeah. Mate, we have covered a lot of stuff today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I could talk to you for three days nonstop because I think it's such an important topic. But one of the things I've really taken out of this uh, apart from the details around UGRs and all the rest of it, is what an incredible force multiplier culture is. When we look to business growth, our, often our first inclination is to look at the operations. Are we getting our marketing right? Are we getting our sales processes right? Are we getting our, you know, this, that, or the other right? And I think they're all worthy of attention, clearly. But the the culture piece, the, the the fish that's hard to catch in your hands is worth pursuing and it's worth getting right because if we look at this and you said at the beginning, if we get this right, it could have an uplift in our business of 40% or 80%, whatever the numbers are, if, if the culture operates as well as it could reasonably ex- be expected to. And I think that's a huge force multiplier. So for everyone listening to this, I, I'd really encourage you to embrace Steve Words and his work. And if you I uh, want to get some more information from Steve. I know he's got a PDF. And, and Steve, you, you're happy for people to email you to get a copy of this resource? 100% Jesse, yes. Yeah, steve at ugrs.net so is my email address. So it's steve at ugrs.net. So ladies and gents, if you want to find out more about this, if you want to explore this, and I'd encourage you to do so, please reach out to Steve, grab that resource, check out his website as well. Uh, You can go to steve-simpson.com. There's some wonderful resources there. And I'd encourage you to have a noodle around. I've been watching the videos there. I've been reading articles and doing all that sort of stuff. And there's some just wonderful resources there. So Steve, um, mate, I just want to say thank you. This I think is a really important topic. I'd love to get you back again and, and continue this if you're up for it, because I feel like we've got this iceberg and we've kind of looked at bits of the iceberg, but I suspect there's a whole lot more going on below the waterline as well. So I'd love to explore all that as well if we can. Thanks, Jesse. I was, um, I don't know how it feels for listeners, but I was surprised that the, the uh, hour is up already. So it's gone quickly for me. I don't know about you or I don't know about the listeners. <laughs> it's gone really quickly. When I just looked up and went, oh, goodness me. Um, so <laughs> once again, mate, thank you. And you're a good man. And I, I hope we can pick this up again because I've really enjoyed talking to you, mate. And it's, it's really important and um, there's so much value in all of this material. So I'm just really grateful for your generosity and your wisdom. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.